this particular panel discussion, I just hand it over to uh, Dr. Anand Ranganathan ji to take the panel discussion ahead and welcome you all again. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. And uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Prabhupada Bhutta Bharat for organizing this, um, what promises to be a very enriching panel discussion. I think the way we've structured it is that we will, we have uh, the five experts with us. Uh, we will discuss, um, uh, I think in its entirety, all the aspects that are concerning uh, this epidemic. Uh, it would be uh, scientific um, aspects, medical aspects, epidemiological aspects, uh, aspects concerning psychiatry, psychology, and society. Um, and the way I think I would like this to go is that uh, I would like to delve deep into and give all my uh, all the experts here enough time so that they can um, answer and uh, make the points that they would like to. And in the end, I have kept some time for some questions from the audience uh, who I had requested to uh, pose some questions for the specific experts. And uh, I would like this to be a very free reading discussion. Um, and uh, so no masks and it will be a very, uh, uh, no, no sanitization of the discussion. So be very frank. Uh, no, no one should be afraid of losing, losing their job uh, concerning the answers that they give. Um, can I, I think, begin? It would be appropriate for me to begin with uh, Dr. Shetty, Dr. Devi Shetty. Uh, he's a renowned surgeon. He's a doctor. He's very well known. And uh, uh, he has been advising the government on and off. Uh, I would like to ask him uh, the following question, which is that uh, Dr. Shetty, uh, good evening, first of all. Uh, uh, if you were to look at the um, the COVID fury, as I would, if I can call it that, around the world, and in in specific uh, context of India, uh, let me give you some uh, uh, some data, which is that um, if you look at the deaths per million um, as of uh, today, uh, Belgium is 677 deaths per million. These are COVID deaths. Spain is 540. Italy 475. UK 414, France 379, Netherlands 295, USA 204, uh, Germany 81, and India 1. One death per million uh, because of COVID. Now, many people, as you know, uh, Dr. Shetty, six weeks ago, was saying that we are only two weeks behind Italy and the USA. Uh, right now, we are, I think, 1,600 deaths. Italy is 28,000, USA is nearing 70,000. Two weeks ago, Italy was 26,000. Uh, so clearly, uh, in your opinion, uh, would you say that we have a, two questions here? A, we have escaped, just looking at the mortality number, we have escaped the COVID fury. And B, uh, one thing that the government has got absolutely right, and C, one thing that this government has not absolutely done. Uh, first of all, I'm not an epidemiologist. No. And uh, my only uh, knowledge is the uh, uh, experience of managing very large critical care services after the heart operation. Now, I have a major interest in public health, mainly because that's what is important for the world. My prediction, my guess, without too much scientific data, is that early lockdown, extended lockdown, announced by the Prime Minister, supported by the government, will bring down the mortality of COVID-19 in this country by at least 50%. Now, remaining 50%, depends entirely on how the uh, various state governments carry on this uh, benefit they had so far further and the next 50 percent there is a lot of hard work which needs to be done by the state governments mainly because you would have all of us are aware of large number of young migrants returning back to their village Believe me, significant number of them will be the carriers of the virus, which they don't know. Quarantining them, spreading the infection, doing large number of tests, 
is the only way forward. If we play our cards well, work with the great strategy, execute it well, concentrating on each and every district. We have about 730 districts. We cannot look at India uh, like one country uh, with the, you know, many states. We have to, we should look at India like Europe. Every country in Europe behave differently. And we will also behave the same manner. Some states like Kerala, Goa, Karnataka will have less number of cases. Some states will have more number of cases. But every state must make strategy for their own district. District should be the focal point and we should monitor on a day to day basis what is happening in the district. Then we would have won the battle. The only thing which can let India down is the shortage of skilled manpower. Now the theater of war will shift from the, the major strategies by the central government to what happens in a district hospital. And this is our weakest point because the shortage of medical specialists in district hospital in India today is nearly 80%. You have heard endless debate about ventilator. That India has only 40,000 ventilator. We need 1 lakh ventilator, 2 lakh ventilator. But no one asked the question, where is the anesthesiologist to connect the patient to the ventilator? There are only 40,000 anesthetists in the country. And 20,000 of them will be more than 40, 50. They will not touch the COVID patient. This is the only thing which can let the country down. Otherwise, so far, government has done everything what they should have done much better than we anticipated and our mortality of covid will be even less than one percent if we increase the number of tests it is a matter of playing with the statistics right thanks if i can raise so uh, the interesting data that you gave was that there are more number of uh, journalists in india than there are anesthesiologists <laughs> <laughs> not, not the same thing i hope uh, but I, I actually wanted, maybe I didn't rephrase the question properly. What I wanted was your medical opinion uh, concerning uh, the doctor as to looking at just the mortality number, which is for America is 70,000. We have three, three months of virus circulating in India, it's 1500. And one thing that we should have done, but we haven't. So we have obviously got something right, medically speaking. For example, I heard yesterday that India is now producing two and a half lakh PPEs every day, you know, things of that sort. So do you feel we've taken these two months of lockdown or nearly two months and gotten ourselves really, you know, buckled up and prepared ourselves for the, uh, uh, you know, for the near future? We have prepared ourselves with everything other than mobilizing the doctor, medical workforce to the relevant hospitals where there is a need. Like, uh, I will give an example. Majority of the largest states have more than 700, 500 to 700 resident doctors undergoing training program in anesthesiology. Now, what the state government should do is to identify them, mobilize them to... There are only, in every state, there are only two or three districts which are badly affected. That is, these are the hospitals which require more medical man, medical manpower. People, doctors of my age is of no use for managing COVID patients. The COVID patients is not safe for doctors past the age of 50, especially doctors with medical condition. So what state government should do now is to mobilize all these young doctors working in different districts of the state to the districts where there is a desperate need. And this is what they have to do. And also they have to recognize there are a large number of doctors who have finished their training in managing ICU care. But the training program is not yet recognized by Medical Council of India. And these are the doctors who are desperately required. If they are told by the Medical Council that you work in the government hospital managing COVID patients for just one year, and we will recognize your diploma degree. You will have few thousand of these workforce. In no time, we can fill up our COVID ICU with young, competent, passionate doctors who can make a huge difference between life and death. 
uh, you think this has been delayed? Uh, this should have been done a month ago, or this is the right time for us to do this? It is not late. We can still do it because our mortality, as I said, is still low. Right. But my fear is when these young migrants, the migrant laborers go back, they may start seeding the disease in districts. Then the number will start skyrocketing. And then there is a problem. Yeah. Right. Thanks very much. Can I move my um, attention to uh, Dr. Raman, who's a renowned epidemiologist? Uh, welcome, Dr. Raman. Uh, uh, you have been giving, you had been giving daily press conferences for a very long time, illuminating all of us as to the goings on every day. Uh, I have uh, two questions for you. I think the first one um, I would like you to take right now, which is that um, on 24th of April, uh, there was this press conference where uh, the member of the Niti Aayog, and he is also the head of one of the Corona task, task forces. He um, uh, he actually um, uh, brought out a chart, and the chart said that India. Um, he ratified, in fact, and he said that India will not have any new cases by May 16th. Now. Do you and this this chart was uh, since uh, after that after that press conference this chart was uh, tweeted by BIB and it went viral. Do you agree with that assessment? I mean, given that we are having about two thousand two and a half thousand odd cases, new cases every day, uh, do you agree that by May sixteenth we will not have any new COVID cases? I think the obvious answer is no. No, not only me. Even Dr. V.K. Paul, he himself may not agree with that. I That day, unfortunately, I was not there when the presentation was made. Yes. I do not know the context with which the uh, PowerPoint was shown. But one must remember that to expect that it would be a Gaussian curve, to expect that uh, you would reach uh, the tail very quickly, is perhaps not very justified for a new disease which is only four months old now and we need to wait how it will behave and we need to remember that environment or the ecology is going to play such an important role that predictions of this kind would almost become extremely difficult to be made i'm sure that he perhaps never meant that there would be zero cases it's just that we have overinterpreted the graph. But as I said, I do not know the context. Right. The other question I'd like to ask is more pertinent because you also have been uh, providing these figures. ICMR has been. And throughout the media, uh, the one figure that has been provided almost daily, almost uh, hour by hour, is the new number of cases and the total number of cases. And in many cases, um, or in many instances, it is actually uh, leading to uh, causing panic. For example, in Gujarat now, the uh, uh, the number of cases is about 4,000, the whole state of 60 million. And correspondingly, looking at the number of deaths, now the death rate in Gujarat is one of the highest in the country. It's about 5, 5.6 to 6%. In Delhi, it is 60 deaths, 4,500 cases, 25 million population. What I want to ask you is why? Uh, why chart out these cases because aren't isn't that meaningless given that the the number of cases is dependent upon the number of tests done and number two uh, only antibody tests can give you the true number of population that was cured that was infected and then cured so for example if somebody had corona did not know about it was asymptomatic or you know a weak cough or very small this thing <laughs> got cured the RT-PCR test would not uh, consider that person positive, whereas antibody tests would. And if you look at about, there are about six or seven cases, international cases, where uh, Holland, uh, you had Japan, Kobe City, you had New York, you had Germany, you had Netherlands. They have conducted antibody tests and found out that the true number of cases is from 10 to 500 times more and the reported cases through RT-PCR test. Now, the problem is India hasn't done the antibody testing. I'll come to that. I'll ask you that why it has not But why chart out cases that are so much smaller in number than the true number of cases there would be? I, 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 I would think it otherwise. No? 
now if you actually see we kept on expanding the indications for testing if you actually see the initial response was to try to offer that to the most vulnerable population which is perhaps our more at risk population than other population which exists in india and then slowly when we expanded we also added one more component because all of us will agree to one phenomenon that the symptoms of this particular disease are so common no you you can perhaps have so many people whom you could call it as symptomatic Correct. but the reality of life would be that these people are more likely to turn out to be negative unless they have a risk of exposure or they they have been exposed to an individual who is actually infected as such now if that is the case the only way we thought at that juncture is for those places where we know we go by this risk based approach and wherever we find that the hotspots have been created even include the influenza like illness in the in the algorithm and if influenza like illness is a part of it one must remember that those symptoms are so mild there could be so many patients of these these kind that would be around which will be offered test now the only question that people keep on saying that what about those asymptomatics that may be there but you need to remember that if you have symptom based approach then you are more likely to capture those who are symptomatic and if you capture a symptomatic and you have contact tracing in place you will find that even asymptomatic will be picked up as much easily people tend to compare us countries which have not which are not only at different stage of this outbreak but also the fact that they do not have public health infrastructure in place for going to contact tracing you just imagine india no i am not saying that we have quality public health infrastructure across in all state and definitely say that that has been our asset that we could even go go up to referring to the there is a of public health system you compare i don't like how the countries you can take any european country you can take uh, usa or you can take any place you will find that most often the healthcare sector has only universities which offer both they, they provide healthcare and they also provide uh, classically even research related inputs uh, to those countries but where is the public health infrastructure we have the public health infrastructure which we use strongly any symptomatic case it was traced as much as possible i am not making a statement that the tracing was 100% because nobody knows how how big is the universe there but one thing which is true is if today even to compare we if we do 24 tests to detect one individual as positive we are far in those comparisons don't make sense to my mind mainly because of level of outbreak and absence of public health infrastructure for contact tracing therefore my feeling is more testing is not going to resolve the issue more who are who are symptomatic if they don't come forward for testing can become an issue and that's what we should be promoting through community involvement so uh, dr raman just to finish on that uh, topic you do believe that uh, gujarat a state of 63 million population has only 5000 covid cases right now you believe that i think you know be i'm sorry there is some audio problem i can't uh... as people from sir those numbers are, could be wrong i would believe those numbers are wrong but in absence of any number i can't just speculate and say that the number that has come out is a estimate of truth no? i but, think it is very difficult to comment on such question
Right, exactly. And uh, that, that is what I meant. I mean, the reason for my saying that, and I'm not blaming you, please don't misunderstand me, um, is that... No, no, no. <laughs> because, because Gujarat right now has only 5,000 uh, cases, uh, a state of 63 million, its death rate is so high. If it had 50,000 cases, the death rate would be a fraction of a fraction, 0.01%. Right now it is 5%. And that is creating a lot of panic. And that is formulating our decisions by the decision makers to extend the lockdown or not. So when the death rate is dependent upon the number of cases, don't you think it is important for us to do antibody tests and find out how many true cases are? Because those, as the world over people are finding out, the, uh, through the antibody test, there are at least 20 to 50 to 60 to 85 times more cases than are found out through RT-PCR. And that really reduces the death rate and the panic. Yeah, there are two things are slightly different. One, when you say that the de death rate is low compared to something else, we know death rate is not uniform for this particular disease. We know that some people are more likely to die due to it because of variety of conditions that are underlying, which also include includes those factors which are related to aging. We also it also depends on the, the treatment seeking behavior of the patient. We also know that it will depend on the quality of care that is offered. So comparing something and kind of a setup and then concluding is a better way to me it becomes extremely difficult to infer just on one figure without knowing the underlying determinants right so uh, with, your, with your permission I'd like to corner you Dr. Raman uh, according to you uh, how many cases do you think Gujarat has right now if not 5000 <laughs> Those answers can never be given for a disease like this, where you know every case that could come in can make a difference in terms of predict how, how many people are going to go to Gujarat. Like, I think we, we are science and speculation so badly that today we tend to give some figure and these figures are always not only contestable you will also find that most often they come out to be incorrect over a period of time i think you need to wait for some time to give these estimates when there is some kind of tends to establish other than hello I think dr raman your connection i, I don't know now i come to if uh, okay i'll i'll just use this opportunity to hello yeah dr raman i think your connection is a bit uh, i don't know whether you finished your answer i can't sorry um, can the administration please tell us if dr raman has finished with his answer yeah, I think his connection is a little bit weak. Okay, can I can I move on? No, that, that. What is that? Right. Can, can I can I move on to Doctor uh, Harish uh, uh, Shetty? And uh, he's he's uh, because I, I think uh, temporarily moving away from the the medical and the scientific aspects of this disease is also something very important, which is the the psychology. Uh, now the whole country has been in a lockdown dr shakti for almost two months now and we don't know i think i suspect um, that our lives have changed the way we we knew them uh, but i want to ask you an interesting question which is you you also um, we, we went through the first original sars epidemic of course that was before the advent of social media so if we, we did not get any minute to minute updates and you know there was not so much of interest in that original SARS epidemic. But if you remember it, uh, during the time it was, you know, catching our attention for about a month or maybe a little bit more, we also thought that the way this epidemic is, is going on, progressing, is going to change our lives forever, where it didn't, you know. 
even people, scientists who had started to make the vaccine against the original SARS-CoV-1, after the, the whole world lost interest, they also lost interest in making vaccines. So as a result, there is no vaccine against SARS-CoV-1. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the same thing is going to happen here. So that is what I asked you. Do you think right now everyone is saying that, look, the world as we see it has changed forever. The way we uh, address uh, questions psychologically, the way we interact has changed forever. But do you think it has? Do you think we will bring back to how we were, uh, you know, two months ago, uh, two months from now? I'll give you three data points and then I will answer this question. A few months ago, the global burden of disease, the data which was released in the later part of 2019 said, one out of seven Indians are mentally ill and 20 crore people need psychiatric treatment immediately. That's one data point. Nimans two years ago said one out of eight to one out of nine people are mentally ill and at least 15 crore need, uh, need uh, immediate treatment. The second data point is that uh, the NCRB figures. One out of three people harming themselves are, is due to family problems. And one out of five people who harm themselves and kill themselves are daily wage laborers. So we have an epidemic on this data and Corona will not cure this epidemic at all. So what I'm going to see is, is, is a very interesting phenomenon. What we are going to see, number one, is that for the first time, Anand, fatalism is on the back seat. Science is on the front seat. I worked at Latur in 92, Kandla in 98, in the riots in Gujarat in 2006. Everywhere I saw, it's all upar wale ke haath mein hai, apne haath mein kuch nahi hai. For the first time, the priests have closed down the temples, mosques, and the churches because people of science told them. And that is a very big shift. The next point is, we all know that there is something known as smashan virag. And that is that you tend to become very existential, very compassionate, very kind for one night. On the next day, you again are competing with the world. You're avoiding your income tax, you're doing everything else. But this disaster is intangible, invisible, and we do not know the future course. If, if that is true, if that is true, I think there will be some change Till Mumbai, Delhi comes back to an autopilot state. I don't think the autopilot state, which we all have experienced after a bomb blast, after a riot, will happen in major cities. Rural India will behave in a different manner. I see a lot of cases coming up to me all the time. And I would like to make two points here. One is all task forces, whether district, as uh, Dr. Shetty beautifully said, the state or the center should have mental health professionals. Now they ask me, we are fighting life and death. Why mental health professionals? For five reasons. Number one, providing mental health is not about feelings, Anand. It's also about food. When the yeah. poor get food, they feel better. Mental health is also not about anything, but it's also, it's also about jobs. Mental health is also about supporting the corona, uh, corona warriors, the doctors and others. They are not heroes of old Hindi movies. They need debriefing every day. They need to be understood every day. These components have to be integrated into mental health relief. There has to be a blitzkrieg for the people to understand how they can cope while they're isolated. Research has shown that constant isolation and long-term isolation can bring down your, your, your longevity. So we need to have mental health interventions across board for people, for corona warriors, for cops, for, for grocers, and for those at high risk. Those who are mentally ill and are taking medicine are breaking down in big numbers. Medicines are not easily available. Vegetables are available only till 12 o'clock. And Anand, you'll, be, you'll get angry when I say this. Alcohol was available till 6 p.m. yesterday. It was it stopped, it stopped in, in, in Bombay. <laughs> That's a different issue. So I think all disasters have mental health consequences. We are look, I am looking at the fact that there will be an avalanche of anxiety disorders, depressive illnesses, and phobias. And when I sit with a client across four feet away with a mask, I can't understand his emotions. I have to, I have to convey my compassion in, in, in a very difficult circumstance. So this new, new normal needs training, understanding, indoctrination, and, and, and assimilation of a very different kind. I don't think India will come back as it came back after the SARS virus. Right. So if I can very quickly add to that, 
uh, you know, uh, one, uh, I would say, um, um, I, I don't know how to put it. Uh, I think the day we, we see uh, the Mumbai locals being as bad <laughs> as our teams uh, as they used to be, uh, maybe India would spring back. But I think your question is so pertinent on two aspects. One is, A, as it is, I think Indians must be the... Um, uh, uh, you know, the only uh, people in the world who don't take psychiatry seriously. You know, I, I don't know the, about the data, but you would know this. I think we population wise, we just don't, uh, you know, we, we don't think of it as a problem at all. And number two would be with obviously the economy, you know, now down in the dumps, not, not just in India, but around the world. Uh, these kind of problems would, as you correctly put it, uh, take maybe months, maybe a year, maybe longer to, you know, for people to, you know, get over. So what's the solution? I mean, what do you think that, do you think the government has a role to play? Because there are, as it is, you said, there are so few psychiatrists. I think this is one problem that we haven't actually heard from the government uh, over the last two months. We really haven't heard. I mean, this is the first time we are discussing psychology and psychiatry of, you know, post Corona and, you know, during Corona. I think we don't have to have a system which is top heavy. If you can train people to treat, to treat malaria to an Anganwadi worker, a mental, we, can, we need a, we need a lots of mental health warriors who are able to identify high risk cases, who are able to provide simple soft counseling to people, who are able also to see that the, the, the community works as a whole. Anand, globalization has disconnected the world. Corona has reconnected the family. And, and bringing back the reconnection needs a lot of creativity. You don't need psychiatrists everywhere. You need a lot of mental health warriors or soldiers who need to be trained to do simple things on the ground. And, and I think I'm sorry to interrupt you here. You know, that, that's a lovely suggestion. But uh, have you heard the government, you know, even thinking about it? And how do you train someone to become a mental health warrior? Can yeah. I, can I, after you answer this, I would like to bring Dr. Shetty because he's in charge of, you know, uh, the medical health, uh, you know, of hospitals. Does he also think that the government should have, you know, should have put its brains behind this? Because this is one aspect, mental health, given the job losses, given the, uh, you know, the um, the problems we're going to have post-corona, that this government should immediately think on these lines. So first you, Dr. Shetty, and then uh, Dr. Devi Shetty after that. Uh, we have been training mental health soldiers before corona. It is okay. not difficult because they don't substitute for psychologists or psychiatrists. They, they carry out creative activities. Say, for example, meaningful full vocation is a mental health intervention. Providing food is a mental health intervention. Sitting down inside a family and sharing your feelings is a mental health intervention. Sitting down in a mall and helping each other is a mental health intervention. This is the face of altruism, where everybody is helping each other. But remember, Anand, Indians run to a disaster very fast and scoot away from the same place much faster. So we're going to move into a stage in, from a stage of, from the honeymoon phase of the disaster to a phase of disillusionment. I think if we can treat malaria, if we can treat so many other illnesses, we can treat the sprain of the mind by mental health health warriors, and they can identify a fracture of the mind for which you need specialists. So we need my 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 teacher, Professor N. N. Wig, uh, late Professor N. N. Wig said, mental health is too important to be left to mental health professionals alone. So we need we need we need a big army of mental health soldiers, and that I think is extremely important. The, the government should also talk about mental health. They should have mental health health professionals in the task force from district to the center. And I would like all 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 people who who are, who are donating money, big philanthropists, to say, I give you 500 crores, but 300 is for this, and we need to do use 200 for, for mental health. Uh, so Dr. Dave, Dr. Devi Shetty, uh, would, you, would you agree with this idea of the government thinking very seriously about, you know, we've heard about COVID warriors, the government thinking seriously and implementing this plan of having mental health warriors? Uh, I'm not really sure about the priorities of the government, but one thing for sure, that uh, we have been uh, doing a lot of uh, consultation online for patients with various heart problems. And a significant number of the patients who have been complaining of chest pain, we could sense that it is not really the heart problem. It is the stress of being at home Indeed. with the fear of losing the job 
isolation. These have caused a lot of discomfort, especially young families who are away from their uh, parents and the family, the, 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 the loved ones, living in a one-bedroom, two-bedroom flat in a city, not able to go out. I think it has caused devastating effect on the uh, life of these people, and they will require a lot of help in the weeks and months to come. Right. So, so like the suggestion given by the other Dr. Shetty that, uh, you know, through philanthropy, if you if you give 500 crores, let a significant chunk of it be uh, dedicated to mental health warriors and the mental problems that people, Indians would face. I think that's Certainly. a good idea. Certainly. Yeah. I think this is a very, very important and often ignored part of uh, yes. the, the public health. Yes. yes. And I myself am to blame. I'll be very honest. You know, the last two months, uh, I haven't really thought about this. You know, this phrase mental health warrior now seems suddenly so important. Yes. You know, if we are to win this battle, uh, we cannot ignore this. Can mm -hmm. I now turn my attention very quickly to, um, uh, I think we still have some time for, uh, you know, taking the other two panelists. Of course we do. Uh, uh, Dr. Chaitra, because, you know, there is a huge social aspect to COVID. And uh, we have all seen those terrible scenes of almost India has a 40 million, maybe more, uh, even more, I'm sorry, uh, just the states of Maharashtra and Delhi and Tamil Nadu have a migrant population of 40 million. And what we've seen, uh, uh, you know, doctor, over the last two months would have been almost traumatic for this huge chunk of population that, you know, we as Indians, middle class Indians, working Indians don't really, you know, think about. But what I want you to do is, uh, uh, you know, to answer is, is there is, is is this damage to them uh, not just uh, through the paucity of food but more psychological? Do you think they'll be able to get over this kind of trauma that millions have been, uh, you know, almost escorted, forced into uh, you know one city where the first thing they would have liked to do, like all of us, would have been to run away to their homes and to meet their family members? What is the kind of stress that the society is presently going through? And do you think with the reopening, inevitable reopening, do you think we'll be able to overcome this societal stress post-COVID? See, one thing is very uh, certain that it will take for the sections that you have been pointing out, the migrant laborers, small scale business people, the people who have migrated from villages uh, looking for better livelihoods to some other suburban places. Now, the stress is not going to go for next two, three years. And there is something that must be done through governmental intervention at this point in time. Because, see, for uh, uh, even, you know, ordinary middle class person, you know, uh, 25,000, 30,000, 40,000, I mean, this kind of amount is manageable. But for him, his total income would, would not be that. I mean, he would be working at an extremely uh, lower financial aid is difficult. Second, he would have created a, a long term setups in terms of how, housing and then arranging some money to his village or something else, you know. So there will be definitely extraordinary kind of stress that will be. But there is another part to it. I mean, if you carefully look at it, the changes that I've been noticing, I've been talking to a lot of people in this period. See, uh, I, I also wanted to link it to the uh, sort of mental health warriors kind of thing. Got because it. I have a different take on it because it's sociologically very important thing. So one of the point of uh, uh, the issue that we can go is that when would India go back to its autopilot mode? Yeah. You know, Now, it will certainly not go back to autopilot mode as they have pointed out six months or one year back. Even when it goes back, it will not be the state where we have started this crisis. Because the kind of sociological changes that are happening. Now, see, one of the interesting things that the, I see an extraordinary advantage in India, and there are a lot of new things that are going to emerge. For example, take uh, the social distancing or take the recommendation on see, the uh, hygiene that is necessarily to be practiced. So there is an extraordinary memory of the culture that is accessible to these people. You know, the, the ritual life, the kind of upbringing that including myself that we had in our village life is something is very handy for us to sustain ourselves. And second, going further, the kind of family structure, the kind of community living that we are used to just about three, four decades back that we have lost for some reason or the other in the growth of uh, in the rat race of the economic development, we have lost out on that part. 
Now that is coming very handy. Now see, if you look at back, for example, in Karnataka state, I can give you an example. They don't want these migrant laborers to go back to their respective places because yeah. the construction industry will have serious problem. Real estate people will have serious problem. But these these laborers, they do not want to stay back. Not just they do not want to stay back, they don't want to come back. Now, for example, the real estate prices in Karnataka during this period, if you carefully look at it, village side, now selling your land is actually, it's a good time to really sell it because now they're getting, they're highly priced. Whereas Bangalore is losing out in terms of the real estate value. So this would actually give you an indication of the change at the macro level. But right. at the local level, now there is an extraordinary response of the people in terms of cooperating and going back to you know, their family structures, the community living, the kind of ritual life that they practice, not so much about the ritual, but a whole range of practices and habits which are part of their life. They're going back to it because they think that that experiential knowledge is seem to be far more favorable than this kind of new way of life. In that sense, sociologically, it's becoming interesting. Right. It's, it's very, very fascinating. But I'd like to supplement that and ask you a very interesting question, because uh, interesting you say that, that, you know, now the the urban uh, centers are worried because the migrant labor is, you know, insistent in moving to the villages. Uh, do you think in the coming years, uh, India might revert to the so-called Gandhian village model? I mean, we all remember the 1950s movies of Naya Dor, you know, where you have these Sati, these songs, Sati Haat Badana, and, you know, people working in the villages. And let me just give you some data and why we've kind of, you know, slowly pushed away from it. Even though agriculture contributes only 12 and a half percent to our GDP, 44% uh, of our 475 million strong labor force is involved in agriculture. 82% of all Indian households are dependent on agriculture. So do you think in the coming years, the migrant labor who is now, uh, you know, thinking that, look, maybe, you know, my life out here was no good. Let me return to the village. Do you think we would see a resurgence? Given the association that Dr. Shetty also talked about, you know, the, the, now people are not talking of globalization, but of family units, you know, do you think India would kind of move back as a society by back? I don't mean regressive, but move back as a society to what it was, i.e. a village utopia or a village life, if you can call it. Yeah, but see, I, I wouldn't get into the Gandhian model because it's unclear what that Gandhian model uh, really refers to because it's quite vague. Okay, but I mean, I can go back to my experience because I was brought up in a village. I mean, I still we still carry in our family lands and we have a particular kind of life. You know, we would certainly go back to our old habits. Doesn't mean that we go to old way of life. We will we will actually innovatively creatively manipulate. See, I, I can get into the specifics. For example, one of the things that my generation and the subsequent generation people are missing in terms of our mental health. You know, you know, is this intergenerational communication that was there in the villages, multiple generation people. See, every child which was brought in a village would have had multiple uh, individual relationship with multiple adults. You know, in in the in across the multiple community. Now, for example, that is going to be re-established because that will serve as a shock observer. You know, you have a lot of people to console you, deal with you, people actually supporting with each other, and this is going to live at least for my generation. And the subsequent generation, because these memories in India are not going to die so fast, because this is disastrous. Okay. Now, second, it's also important. Now, people have gone this this chase of the urban uh, area was not really pushing them towards some kind of happiness. Now, they are actually this quest for searching for happiness. You know, we have different words which are used in local languages has become the center part of the. If you if you talk to a migrant labor. Then ask him, what are you searching for by going uh, back to village? You're not going to this money. Look, look at the kind of language that you'll be using. So he is going back to the idioms and phrases which are actually connected to what I had experienced, what I was brought up as valuable in part of my life. And also, it also comes back. Now, it's a, it is going to address a large number of issues in a different way, like the old age population, for example. The way suddenly we started looking at old age population has dramatically changed which was going in a wrong direction in a couple of a couple of decades back now it was a problem suddenly it is getting changed in that sense even if it takes about two to three years but there is one thing which is going to be sure that the rural areas are going to flourish hereafter because people right. are willing to go back this, the this question would be getting at. sorry to interrupt you because uh, you know if you remember uh, narendra modi um, at the at the uh, uh, 
at the cusp of the 2019 elections, he said the previous five years, we have, uh, I don't know what, uh, what word he used, but he said for the next five years, this is of course before Corona and before, you know, the world changed, he said, I'm going to look after, our policy are going to look after the aspirational class. So now do you think there is going to be an honest assessment by millions of Indians, maybe half the Indian population, to say that, look, uh, you know, an honest assessment of aspirational means that, look, let me just go back to my village. Let me tend to my small family unit, my grandfather, my father who there. Let me be happy. What have I to gain by staying out here, working in a cement factory where, you know, and especially now post Corona, the lot of even today, uh, Madhya Pradesh has relaxed a lot of labor laws, you know, making uh, uh, you know, uh, yearly uh, inspection now, it's out of the wind. So, you know, there are a lot of laws because the urban centers want industries to prosper uh, that inevitably would be at the cost of the working people. So do you think this aspirational, uh, uh, you know, urge that you had amongst people, rural population that are shifted to the urban centers is now over? Do you think they would prefer to now go back Oh, I mean, see, the, see the, it's a complex question to answer, but in, in this way, uh, let me put it why. See, the aspirational part won't die off. Yeah. Okay. Now, the, the kind of aspiration itself would change. Hmm. Right? And whether government likes it or not, next 10 years, that is going to be the driving force. 10 years, you cannot change it. It is going to go that way. But the question is, would government willing, would government be willing to take this opportunity? To rethink on standards and how do we refurnish infrastructure and other resources to these areas to deal with it, number one. And second, now people like Harish Shetty, Devi Shetty, Sarah, I mean, all these people can put together and actually think of this world institution where their experiential knowledge functioned as counselor to deal with multiple generations of people. Now, right. there are caste institutions. There are village temple institutions to village as a unit. There are multiple institutions which are not visible in our rat race of GDP, now can be thought of very carefully. And it certainly requires an expertise help from the disciplines where they have been putting their energy in studying the psychology, social psychology and psychiatry. They should come and really re-strengthen it. And see, th these many days, what used to happen is, for example, experiential knowledge is thrown out as superstition. Now, now, that is not going to be the case. It is going to be worthwhile. It's going to be valuable. One has to go back and rework around it. I mean, figure out what is not required, what is required, and how do you meddle with it. And you, you cannot create, see, you can't create a paid warriors for this. Yeah. But there are institutions in our culture which are available. Mind you, this opportunity is available for South Asians and Southeast Asians. Right. Europe, for example, doesn't have these institutions. And yeah. we do have it. Okay, there is also a third most important uh, aspect, I mean, which is intellectually fascinating. See, the all rural areas, for example, if you look at last one and a half centuries of sociological research, you know, see, the touch is always associated with dignity. Mm -hmm. This comes from Europe peculiarly, and it was linked with, you know, all kinds of issues in sociological theorization. Now, that will that is going to take a toll now. Mm -hmm. Now, we, in Corona, we discovered touch is not associated with dignity. Yeah. It is something else. What it is? How do we understand? For example, even in Bangalore city, I'm perplexed that a place like Care Market, it's one of the busiest markets in Bangalore. When people move around, they don't touch each other. Yeah. You don't have physical contact. And the people don't touch each other. You see, we are a little reluctant. Not that we don't oh, touch un -Indian. each other. It's the most un-Indian thing to do. I don't know how we're going to cope. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, so in a, in a very interesting way, uh, there is going to be a huge shift and there are institutions which are readily accessible in uh, uh, in our culture and they are going to be foregrounded and and whether governments like it, whether intellectuals like it or not, this is going to come. This is going to happen. Now, the question is, are we willing to take an advantage of this? Right. And so there is no change in terms of aspiration because it is the nature of human being to have aspirations. Of course, if you don't have aspiration, you don't have hope in life. Mm -hmm. Right. So. But these aspirations are going to shift towards somewhere else. Faster I mean, the government. You were saying, you know, that aspiration is good, but I think there is an element of nihilism or fatalism that creeps in after every epidemic or a disaster, you know, that people get more, uh, I don't know. Uh, no, you but, know, but, but, but you must also see, you must also see that, you know, we went through a series of epidemics in India. Yeah. And I have heard stories. I was brought up 
hearing these stories. And in my village, when I used to travel, they used to show me the houses where in plague they were relocated. You know, these stories were known. With all the negative part aside, people actually transmitted knowledge for us to cope up with it. We have yeah. stories. You know, we don't have historical data. We don't need it. We have stories because it gives us heuristics to go and deal with the real world. And all these people have it. And the challenge would be that would we be taking the cues from our ancestor, be able to transmit this heuristics to our next generation. Yeah. In that sense, we need to think about the changes that are happening uh, in what is happening in the world because you go and talk to not just the migrant labor, talk about IT professional who is very close to pink slip. Yeah. Okay, he's not far away. Now, what is he doing? He is actually, he is now stopped using credit card. Now, they want to clear off all their EMI. Somehow they want to sell and they want to safely buy some land somewhere. They want to go and repair their old. And you see, all these plans have been, I mean, I keep noticing with my friends, it has been happening rampantly. So in that sense, the, this shift, which is going to be very practical, you can't stop it, and society has taken its course already, is something that we should tap into. And government and other so organizations. A, would, you, would you say uh, that I would be putting it correctly if I said it wouldn't be a body blow to aspiration, but it would be a, a small slap? Oh, yes, absolutely. I, would, I wouldn't question you at all. Because if, what is going to happen is there will be a shift in the aspiration. Right. Uh, can I now quickly move to uh, uh, Professor Govardhan Das? Sorry to have kept you uh, waiting, Professor Das, for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. But I wanted to keep the best for the last, if I could say so. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've, I, I did, in, the, in the beginning, I did talk about the mortality number. Not our mortality rate, but mortality number. And I compared, let's say, Italy. Uh, America, UK uh, to India. So per per million population, UK uh, is you know 400. Italy is 500 uh, COVID deaths per million. US is 210. India is one. And even if you were to look at not normalization with the population, just the the data, hard data itself, Italy is 28,000. US is uh, 70,000. India is 1,500. Now you, uh, before the lockdown, you know, we were talking and you had come up with this idea that maybe it is our universal BCG immunization that is going to save us in a, in a major way, uh, escape the COVID fury. And this you had said uh, on, I think, 14th March. Uh, what was the basis for you saying that? And do you think uh, the data that has come out in the last, uh, 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 you know, two months, has validated your assessment, if you could kindly uh, you know, illuminate yeah. on that. Yeah. Thanks, Anand, for having me. Uh, I'll just get my charger. I'm so sorry. Please continue. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. So uh, thanks, Anand, for having me. Uh, actually, uh, when this uh, COVID-19 is spreading out, out of China, then um, we started looking at the data from the Europe. And then uh, uh, over a period of time, it started, uh, you know, uh, spreading all over the world. When we looked at it, there is one thing so far consistent to what we looked at it, whether the country, a given country, whether they are immunized with BCG or not. So when we looked at the data and we started analyzing data from all those countries who are having incidents more than 1,000 cases and so far, and uh, then uh, we thought only one common thing is coming is the BCG immunization. And that also have a little history. That's because over a couple of years, right now, uh, there's an intense research on uh, BCG saying that the BCG is not only, um, uh, it does uh, something called innate memory or the hard um, immunity or the, um, uh, because of uh, actually what BCG does uh, it goes to a cell and then it changes the me metabolic uh, programming and also something called um, epigenetic uh, uh, changes. Because of those, the program of immune development, rather, it, it changes. And that, uh, from there, we uh, actually connected with the incidents in various countries. And so there is a fantastic correlation. Uh, and then uh, finally, what we looked at, we analyzed the data uh, with age-wise, and you will be surprised to see there is a, in those who are having uh, immunization with BCG, 
we are having the as more than one log and a 10 to 100 times uh, being 10 to 100 times better not only in terms of incidence but also in terms of uh, mortality so uh, then i started talking about all these in, in, in social media as well and uh, at that time there was kind of reservation from various organizations that includes the who and then finally i saw yesterday that the 14th paper is now claiming yes there is relation with the uh, bcg immunization versus uh, uh, covid um, sustainability and one example um, people are uh, talking about uh, all this it could be something else it could be food habit genetic makeup and uh, uh, you know uh, climate etc i can take you the one example in spain and versus portugal uh, spain is the country and as a portugal is, is this uh, big country or as portugal is a small country almost three sides in, in spain and they are uh, more or less like genetically of course not the uh, same but definitely uh, some kind of identical food hab habit also similar and also climate is the similar only spain is immunized with the, with the uh, bcg whereas uh, yeah, spain is not uh, immunized with the bcg while portugal is if you look at the incidence as well as the the casualty data is is surprising in the log difference so basically from all these the other question uh, professor das that people do ask is that what about the case of iran uh, i mean iran also has universal bcg immunization yes uh, i yes i agree with that uh, with that iran but that see, only 84 was it uh, right in and iran there are two factors let me tell you the iran started immunization of bcg in 1984 which is around uh, 27 uh, whatever years if 35. you look at the uh, 34 what the if you look at the incidence and the mortality in um, with uh, covid is a uh, uh, 50 plus and uh, uh, 60 plus years basically those who actually are victims actually miss the basic uh, vaccination and second thing i would like to talk about uh, if you look at the data we did analyze the data because all the BCG immunized countries, those who adopted BCG immunization, every country is not equally well. So what could be the difference? We went ahead and looked at the all the BCG history, as you know. Oh, you mean different strains. Different countries are using different strains. That's correct. Very, very correct. Actually, uh, we, there are uh, so far seven different substrains are available. In the, India and Japan, what we use is something called mix and the bcg japan so in we did analysis all this data with from various countries with age wise what we found the two strains basically those who use something called mixed strain and that's called the uh, bcg japan are the most giving the uh, 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 best uh, immunity or best protection on the other hand the like uh, dennis uh, and the uh, denmark uh, they are not really giving that much of uh, uh, protection but, but still it's much better than those who have not been immunized so germany is now carrying out uh, the trial for a recombinant bcg where they have uh, i think deleted the urease gene is that uh, <clears throat> well i mean that is the uh, stephen kaufman's um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, vaccine that i know so uh, they uh, they deleted urease gene because of different reason uh, they wanted to delete that reason and they put it something called LLO, listerylization yeah. uh, yeah. protein. Listerylization protein is coming from listeria um, monocytogen, which is the responsible for um, migrating bugs from the phagolysosome to the cytosol. Mm -hmm. As you know, for the uh, cytotoxic T cell activation, one antigen or bug has to go to the cytosol because of uh, for mounting uh, cytotoxic T cells or CD8 T cells one has to uh, present the antigen uh, you know class one antigen an antigen presentation pathway so therefore to have the better uh, cytotoxic t cell responses probably um, uh, that uh, this strain is being developed so however I have, I, yeah sorry yeah. Uh, I have however, a couple of questions here uh, yeah. one uh, professor das is that um, uh, as you as you say and your your hypothesis is that even though bcg is antibacterial in nature i mean it is against supposed to be against tuberculosis works in children not so much in adults here it is acting as antiviral because of something called the tri 
second immunity that it actually induces the expression of the cytokines so uh, like il6 and in uh, gamma interferon and so on and so forth correct that's, uh, that's well, yeah go ahead right. so now the the question is that isn't that one of the problems with the covid infection because the sars cov 2 is supposed to lead to or infection of sars cov 2 is supposed to lead to what is called the cytokine burst so as it is the moment you have the infection your cytokines are at a much higher level so bcg is also doing that i i couldn't quite understand why do you then need bcg if as it is upon infection by covid or sars cov 2 your cytokines would automatically be raised to a much higher level See, this is uh, Anand. So all I'm not an immunologist, so this might yeah. be a yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I got your uh, question. See, all the uh, inflammatory cytokines are not really antivirals, mm -hmm. but uh, see, uh, for uh, antiviral uh, immunity, we mostly depend on something called type one interferons. Mm -hmm. And type one interferons, uh, basically, uh, virus has this uh, ability to inhibit the uh, production of. Uh, type 1 interference. So basically, there is a balance of uh, immune response. Either you are going for the some cytokines, which are actually uh, uh, host protective, some others is not really does much of host protection, that does inflammation. So there are uh, area of cytokines. The BCG is the one which, pro, uh, which gives you the uh, type 1 in, uh, interferon, like uh, uh, interferon, uh, type 1 interferon IL-6, and that leads to the probably in the um, inhibition of the uh, virus. Type one interferon does uh, various things that includes uh, the uh, you know packaging and inhibiting the um, RNA synthesis. So basically, uh, that is what it could be. The it is the difference. So uh, and uh, second thing I would say basically when there is virus is already is being um, you know the patient is already in uh, critical conditions is a uh, dr shetty will be uh, uh, will correct if i'm wrong the patients are having go through the severe lymphopenia so basically all the lymphocytes and phagocytes migrate to the site of infection so basically when you are uh, the patient is uh, having the severe lymphopenia and is it is in the lung so probably even if you inject the immunize the bcg in the periphery, it may not work. So that is what my my worry is. Uh, probably Dr. Shetty will, uh, you know, can tell you better than than me about this. Uh, uh, you know, about this when yes. and how we can inject and how we can immunize the BCG. Right. The the other question I'd like to ask you is that you um, you not only talked about BCG, but you said that we as Indians have something better. Which is this MW uh, Mycobacterium pranai? Yeah. Uh, could you just elaborate on that? I mean, why is that different from BCG, and why do you feel that this strain might confer better uh, protection? Yeah. So uh, when, uh, as you know, this is in mid uh, March when we are talking about all these BCG correlations, without uh, uh, going much of the detail. What I uh, proposed that um, we should adopt the uh, MIP, something called Mycobacterium indicus pranai, and uh, also known as the MW. That's because of two reasons. We work for both the BCG as well as the MIP in my laboratory. When we did work with uh, both the strains, what we found, actually the MIP does much better um, type 1 interferon uh, response especially interferon alpha and interferon beta as well as what we saw because of the uh, the you know um, uh, doubling uh, time of mip is little longer than the bcg so but we say attenuated strain so basically and the amount of immune response is is generates is much uh, bigger or much better than that of uh, bcg so that is what, uh, and also it does uh, induce cytotoxic T cells. That data already, we have it, we, we know it. And that is what immediately I thought uh, we should go for instead of BCG, even if it gets a little better than BCG, we should go for uh, 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 MIP immunization. That's what I kept on writing to the ministry and 
the our icmr dg and i kept on writing them you should adopt mip and uh, you'll uh, you'll be happy to know the mip is being right now is uh, being uh, you know uh, uh, in clinical trial in at least the three of the institutions uh, uh, aims bhopal pgi chandigarh and aims jodhpur right thanks very much i think we have uh, we have some time now to take uh, questions from the audiences uh, this one is from um, uh from sharat and it is to dr devi shakti he asked uh, do asymptomatic patients carry lesser viral load than symptomatic people if that's the case under what circumstances are you likely to get infected if you come in contact with the asymptomatic i'm not really sure about the quantity of virus in these patients body but asymptomatic patients can be significant carriers of virus and unfortunately or fortunately more than 80% of the covid positive patients are asymptomatic all they would have got was a mild cold and cough with a little bit of body ache and they they are young people they just pass it off as you know common cold and uh, they get on with life for next two weeks they will keep on spreading the virus this has been the single biggest problem in managing covid right and there is another one to you uh, dr devi shakti from pratosh um says i am from chennai my question is to dr shetty uh, what is his view on current corona virus situation numbers likely to touch lakh or more few days and are we really going doing the right testing and doing things right we are we definitely need need to do lot more test especially in districts <clears throat> when the uh, number starts rising because of the uh, uh, arrival of the migrants which can happen so the number of tests we definitely need to increase we will definitely see lot more patients than what we are seeing today but i am only hoping i i don't think it will reach a proportion which becomes unmanageable in most parts of the country i think it will definitely be higher than what it is today but it won't be unmanageable other than the whatever is happening in some big cities in india in uh, these places it yeah. since the number to start off is very small they will be able to contain right uh, this is uh, to professor govardhan das from some hunt called jisko block kiya hai uska dusra account i'm sorry he hasn't given his name <laughs> what, what is that what is that jisko block kiya hai uska dusra account this is the name of the hunt um uh, and the question is to you professor das it says um uh, if soap can kill the virus uh, can uh, can we have a treatment concerning soap vapor and the second is when are we going to have a vaccine for corona well i mean soap and soap paper the, does the, of course the same thing one does the in the paper there is soap is there so basically uh, uh, same way you have to wash hand for 30 seconds of course the you know all um, around your hand uh, when we are going to have a vaccine this is as you know the whole world is now trying for uh, this vaccine and uh, uh, up to yesterday i thought there are uh, 68 of them are in, in in various stages so in fact um, i heard that in, in india there are 30 of them now are being being tried so basically uh, any one of them come any time uh, we do not know the uh, uh, but one thing i would like to mention so uh, developing a vaccine is not a one day job but is years after years but at so this this is what i want to ask because i asked this of uh, 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 dr hari shetty uh, you know by the time you get to a proper vaccine after all the trials maybe nobody you know people would have forgotten sars do like they forgot sars 1 so maybe nobody would get vaccination do you foresee such a scenario or do you think this is to professor govardhan das do you think uh, we would have this sars cov 2 different from sars cov 1 and this sars cov 2 would last for another 5 years 6 years so vaccine would be needed well i mean as you see this is uh, many of the predictions are coming right at this moment and saying that um, sars cov 2 the covid 19 is not going to go away so easily and 
is going to come uh, 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 come in again but my uh, worry is the as you see the uh, every virus has this uh, the common wave and the go so one wave right now is going on and probably it may sometime it come down and it may come back again so whether we are going to get it or not get it we are certainly we need to uh, you know keep our um, effort uh, to make a uh, vaccine and we should be ready and we should get rid of it that is what um, uh, uh, i in my opinion right and yes in in uh, sars 1 the it's uh, because of it was epidemic but it was not as uh, you know spread all over uh, the world it was the how many i think 3000 deaths for the uh, sars 1 so basically uh, so basically uh, because of it was not that severe uh, in terms of infectious uh, uh, you know property so people might have forgotten but definitely not uh, covid 19 it could also be that it was caught much early and contained and like in this case where china allowed 7 million people to go to and fro from wuhan and exacerbated the whole situation had china imposed the lockdown much earlier you know this problem uh, we wouldn't have faced but that's that's a question for another day i have a couple of questions for dr raman from um, sk tweet he says uh, do you think this is a natural virus and not a man made virus dr raman and the second is uh, what happened to the antibody test kits from south korea that we were supposed to have had one month ago yeah we come to the first one whether it is a man made virus or otherwise I think we have some audio. The bandwidth is low. Network issue, maybe. Uh, right. Unless, we, if that was true. Hello. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I think the the problem is in the is a network problem or a bandwidth problem. We're not able to hear you, Doctor Raman. Hello. Yes. Am yes. I audible now? Uh, I don't know uh, uh, what part of the answer was heard, but I would just repeat: no country would be would be willing to. I'm sorry. I think we've lost Dr. Raman again. I'll I'll come back to you, Dr. Raman. There is a question from uh, Seema to Dr. Devi Shakti. Um, Uh, on what have you pinned your hopes more uh, dr shetty uh, a drug or a vaccine against corona i have pinned my hope on the ability of the uh, government and the medical fraternity to uh, uh, overcome this uh, problem in the short run in the long term yes after a year or perhaps on the vaccine Yeah. Uh, there is a question for Dr. Chaitra from Reshma Nair. Says, uh, given the awful conditions in which the poorest Indians regularly live, uh, underpaid labourers, slum dwellers, beggars, without much thought being given uh, them by middle and upper class, is our sudden concern for their well-being during the coronavirus pandemic hypocritical? Uh, <clears throat> i i wouldn't uh, consider it uh, uh, hypocritical it just that indian society had forgotten a lot of things in last 30 35 years it is a time where they realize that they have forgotten uh, precisely because they are also at risk and uh, now for the first time people have been uh, discovering in last three decades that uh, agar mera ghar mein problem hai to meri hai dusre ghar mein hai to mera nahi hai so that mentality is sort of going on so that's one of the point that i was emphasizing so we have the cultural memory that we are going back to we we are remembering It's just that says, that sense has gone for some reason or the other so, so now it's coming back. do do you think uh, dr chetra that in some uh, strange way this virus has actually brought indians together from all social strata economic strata 
Oh, true. That's how we used to be, and that's how it is going to be. Now it, it, it's going to come back. It's also uh, going to raise many other questions, which Indians are going to take it very seriously. But I mean, to simply ask you, we are going back to experiential knowledge that is available in our culture. We are going to sift them, clean it, and get it. I mean, it, is, it will not be any more of this WhatsApp university stories. There will be serious reflection that is going to happen because your lives are at stake. He, you can you can bullshit about a lot of things when it, it doesn't impact you. When you are at stake, then you know the lot of other garbage will cut down, and you will be reflective about it. Another question for you uh, again, Dr. Chetra from Anil. He says, uh, "Do you think do we have any data where Indians have become more philanthropic uh, after COVID or during COVID, or do you think we are the same?" I'm not sure whether to use this word philanthropic or not because philanthropy is a word which comes from a particular cultural context and it has its own connotations. But one thing I will tell you, I will make an answer very simple. I mean, what you wanted to get can be clarified like this. See, you go to apartment complexes, you know, you go anywhere. There are security people who come and stay there. There are no hotels and they can't carry food. And look at how Indians are responding in terms of taking care of them. Now. This is precisely what Indian culture is all about. So that's something that people have forgotten about dealing with another human being in a particular way because you know they got into this new fray of uh, seeing money is somehow getting diverted and making them to think about themselves. Whether you want to call it philanthropy or not, I wouldn't call it philanthropy. But so you want to call it, yeah. There, there is something positive uh, uh, that, has oh, come yeah. Out, that will come out of uh, this. Uh, Dr. Charuhas is asking a question to Dr. Harish Shetty. Um, how do we deal with this point, this phrase called coronophobia? Coronophobia. I think your audio is. Uh, I'm sorry, you're not audible. Sir. I think his audio is muted. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, there is one question um, from Pramod to uh, Dr. Devi Shakti. Um, and he says, uh, Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Sorry, please, please, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There was some problem. Yeah. It was muted uh, by the, the admin. So, uh, uh, number one is that first look at the scientific facts of Corona. That's number one. Number two, don't be ashamed to share your feelings about how you feel. You may be a vice president in a company or you may be uh, you may be owning a corporate. Be honest about your feelings with your family and friends. Number three, you should connect with your family, but don't over connect, which means you need to connect with your family, but you need to connect with the safe space in life, the safety net, your bum chums with whom you have been meeting for a long time, where you can be completely emotionally nude. If these things calm you down, and if you're assured that, that the phobia is less, little fear and anxiety is normal. Also, 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 what is very important to understand that corona is a virus, if it's an innocent virus, it does not invite you to its den. It has been released by forces of nature, I do not know what. It doesn't, it cannot, it cannot fly and come to your house. So you need to look at all the facts, share your feelings, and, and share with your bum chumps of how you feel. Beyond this, if you cannot sleep, if you have palpitations, you feel that there's an impending doom, if you're going to die, do not call an astrologer, call a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Every family has a priest, but let every family have a psychologist. Just to, just 10 seconds more in your style, Anand. We do not want paid mental health warriors. Yes. We need to use the cultural wisdom which is existing in the country, but to romanticize about the wisdom that is there everywhere, I don't think that is true. We cannot go behind all the time for all the answers in our in our society. Thanks very much. One last question uh, from Pramod uh, to Dr. Devi Shetty again. A lot of questions to Dr. Devi Shetty. This one says, uh, hand on heart, doctor. Uh, in the past two months, have you been uh, preferential towards corona and have you forgotten other diseases? Sorry. Yes, yes. That is <laughs> that is the unfortunate the truth. We have behave. We are behaving as if the other diseases like heart disease or cancer. Are, yes, it is a serious problem. 
partly because this is a new disease we have no idea how it will behave and also partly because of the fear and also the policy of the government the first uh, uh, notice to all of us is that keep all your infrastructure empty for the possible flooding of hospitals with covid patients so we uh, followed those instructions but in spite of us keeping massive infrastructure ready uh, fortunately by the grace of god we haven't seen a single covid patient in our hospital so the uh, uh, we can't complain that was the right thing to do but gradually now we are getting back to work we started seeing non covid patients and started surgeries as well i hope the same trend continues right thank you very much i think with that uh, uh, with the permission of the administration we can bring the wonderful panel discussion to a close i know it's uh, it's very difficult but if i were to take one message home from this it would be what uh, uh, dr harsha harish had said that is that we and this government need to stress upon getting an army of uh, mental health warriors i think that is uh, so we we had a wonderful discussion on epidemiology on the sociology on uh, the medical aspects of it on the scientific aspects of it but i think that that message that we need to cope with post covid scenario we need an army we need uh, mental health warriors is something that that i am taking thanks very much administration thank you. for having thank us here thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. thanks for thank you. Thank you dr arun and anand it was really a great uh, i hope most for all of us and it was like uh, hearing everybody the authorities on the subject and uh, the last question was really uh, hopeful for us uh, which dr devi should be yeah. so i think the india is going to get back to his normal in the coming days uh, and we were also hopeful about the numbers that what you predicted that that we may not achieve so that's a really a good task i thank all the panelists especially dr raman dr devi shetty dr hari shetty professor gobal das ms chaitra uh, for sparing their valuable time i know we you all of you are all covid warriors and uh, uh, sparing your time is really difficult we are really thankful sir for sparing your valuable time and enlightening the entire india on this uh, subject thank you very much and uh, dr raghunathan it was really a tough task for you to no, not wait no. <laughs> great qualities no, no. on this subject and you did really extremely great and thank you very much sir. thank you very much thank you very much bharat i thank you all again uh, for the wonderful discussions that what we had thank you very much thank you my pleasure uh, there was a uh, there was a glitch uh, in the technical session uh, which mm -hmm. aditya noticed but uh, that is part of life uh, anyway we have the recording uh, thank you very much thank you all thank you thank you bye bye thank you very much thank you Thanks very much. <laughs> very thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Anand. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I'll be in touch with you, Anand. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Anand ji. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Aditya. Yes. Hey, can you come live? Okay, can you start your video? Uh, all the live lives are open, closed now, Aditya. Ha, lives are closed. You have closed the Facebook and YouTube. Yes, finished. Okay, okay, okay. Like that. In between, there was a problem, Sachin. Uh, yeah. Everything went down, uh, but it took around one or two minutes to get it back, and there was a lagging. But anyhow, okay. uh, we have got the recording also. We can we can re repost the recording, the recording also. So we can we can just uh, reload the.